This is a conversation with the writer Daniel Pinchbeck. I first found Daniel's work with his book Breaking Open the Head, which is all about his journey with psychedelics. He's then moved on to cover everything from social change, existential risk, the occult, and much more. This conversation covers many different topics, including our different attitudes to the subject of conspiracy theories, a long conversation about the situation with Ukraine and Russia. And we also addressed his high profile sex scandal and cancellation from a few years ago. So I really enjoyed this conversation with Daniel, and I hope you do too. Daniel, welcome. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, so this feels like a conversation that's a little bit overdue, Daniel. We've been in touch kind of informally. We've been at some of the same events uh, in the past. My friend Ronan, I think you came to Alter Ego that my friend Ronan ran uh, a couple of years ago now, maybe a little bit more, maybe maybe four or five years ago. So we've been, and I've, I've been a, a big fan of your work, especially your book, Breaking Open the Head, which I think came out now in 2002, all about your exploration with psychedelics and I think I read that twice. Um, so yeah, I've been aware of your work and um, we've been in very similar circles, similar similar kind of backgrounds. So yeah, I'm, I'm really looking forward to this conversation. May, maybe before I kind of summarize what this conversation might be about, if you could just do a sort of introduction, potted history of your background and where you've ended up now. Uh, wow, okay. Um, let me think about that. So yeah, I mean, I the, the I, elevator pitch, the elevator pitch, Daniel, I know there's a lot to get through. Uh, I mean, I'm from New York City. My parents were an artist. My mother's a writer. Um, I was working in journalism uh, in magazines in my 20s, also, you know, writing poetry and fiction. I had a literary magazine. I had a kind of spiritual emergency, existential crisis in my late 20s that led me back to psychedelics, which I'd explored in college. That led me to write this first book, Breaking Open the Head. On psychedelic shamanism that was like before the new psychedelic renaissance so it felt very fresh and kind of dangerous terrain uh, you know when the book came out i was even afraid i would get like stopped in airports like you were, really were not allowed to talk about psychedelics publicly in the mainstream so it was kind of breaking uh, new, new territory and i think helps maybe shift the cultural discourse actually the book was you know fairly well received you know sell deep sell, sell you know with decent seller and you know was repu- reviewed nicely in the new york times and so on um with that book, uh, I went to Africa. I went through the Iboga initiation in Gabon. I went visited an indigenous community in the, the Ecuador and the Amazon to work with ayahuasca. Visited another indigenous group in Mexico to work with psilocybin. Also wrote about Burning Man and kind of psychedelic uh, chemistry and Sasha Shulgin and so on. Um, but and I had a number of experiences that were kind of transpersonal, you know, mystical, occult, kind of um, psychic, kind of paranormal. And this was not something that I had you know, believed in before writing the book. I came from a more skeptic, materialist background. So it ended up engendering like a very deep like transformation of like worldview and, 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 and paradigm. And it also led me to another book, 2012, The Return of Quetzal Bottle, uh, which was basically some of the main people that I've looked at for the first book, including Terence McKenna and also this Jose Arguelles. And they were very focused on Kind of these uh, Mesoamerican prophecies, this idea that there was some in, you know inevitable transformation of consciousness um, that was occurring. So yeah, so that, that led, me, led me to write the 2012 book um, where I you know worked with the Santo Daime in Brazil and uh, explored crop circles in England and looked at a lot of like esoteric phenomena, psi phenomena, uh, you know monistic idealism as a kind of uh, philosophy. Um, and uh, people like Gene Gebser and Carl Jung and Rudolf Steiner and so on. And um, so that book came out. Then I started a, a magazine, Reality Sandwich. I had a company called Evolver. I was trying to put ideas into practice because I was very concerned that we only had like a you know, relatively short period of time uh, to deal with like the ecological catastrophe and also kind of like uh, political economic crises and so on. So uh, I started like a movement, we had many local groups that sort of fell apart ultimately for various reasons. Um, and then I um, wrote a second, a third book, How Soon Is Now, which was an effort to kind of apply the sort of, you know, worldview that I just developed around like psychedelic phenomenology and so on, but try to sort of map out kind of a systems design model using people like, you know, ranging from Buckminster Fuller to Anna Arendt, uh, what would be the pathway to avert, uh, you know, system crash, uh, and uh, all that kind of stuff. So 
recently, I've been writing some smaller books. Well, I wrote, actually, I wrote a, a book called When Plants Dream with a young woman anthropologist, Sophia Rocklin, which was like, a, it's like a whole history of ayahuasca, almost like a biography of ayahuasca, looking at many different aspects. And I've been writing some shorter books, um, self-publishing. I wrote a book on the afterlife, looking at a range of different perspectives on you know, whether there's any possible existence, like spirit or soul after death, what we can learn from all the studies of near-death experience, uh, mediumship, um, uh, yada, yada. Uh, and um, yeah, so here I am. <laughs> so yeah, lots of kind of jumping off points and overlaps with a lot of the conversations we've been hosting on Rebel Wisdom around sort of game B as a kind of placeholder for an alternative system. So yeah, there's a huge amount of kind of jumping off points. Um, to, to kind of keep this conversation as narrow uh, as we can yeah. for the next hour or so, I'd love to talk a little bit broadly about conspiracy because this is a topic that I'm, I'm actually publishing a piece at the same time as this about that you've already read about Majid Nawaz's appearance on Joe Rogan. And the topic of conspiracy is one that I feel very, um, what's the word, wary about talking about too much on, on the channel for various reasons that I'll explain and we can kind of go into. But you're someone who's looked at it, and I think you're the right person to explore this topic with because you, you've looked at it uh, to quite a deep level. Why I am hesitant is because this, firstly, it's an overloaded term that the there is sort of, it's a way of dismissing people. And a lot of, when you talk about it, a lot of people bring that up, that it's an overloaded term. You're talking about kind of something that is, by definition, any um, sort of secret collaboration between people could come under that term, but also, there are kind of all encompassing conspiracy theories like QAnon that for me kind of fall, yeah, completely fall apart when you start looking at them. Also, we've got the kind of Illuminati light uh, iconography here. So we're kind of attract. And I, I find the reason I was wary about putting out that piece about Majid Nawaz was, do I really want the heat? Do I really want to kind of go into, you, you get a lot of people with a lot of passion. You get a lot of people with kind of very, um, esoteric perspectives and a lot of kind of um yeah there's a lot there's a lot of people there who who are very but like friends of mine in journalism have, have decided not that it's a topic that's just not worth going into they friends of mine uh, um carl miller and uh jamie bartlett found that they had a lot of very impassioned people who actually came around to their workplace researched on them kind of decided that they were definitely being paid by the government or that kind of like deep conspiracy mindedness that at some point I'm just like do I really want to go into this topic um so yeah I've thrown a lot at you there what's your kind of attitude to the general the general topic of conspiracy stuff yeah I mean it's definitely you know a, a strange attractor you know for a certain type of you know personality, psychology, you know, schizotypal, I guess is, is one phrase to describe it. Uh, I mean, so, I mean, I come at this from a, you know, kind of different angle, I guess, because I had all these shamanic, um, you know, psychic paranormal experiences. And then I got very interested in thinkers like, you know, ranging from Rudolf Steiner to Castaneda to, to you know, to uh, Gurdjieff, who, you know, kind of um, offer a whole different lens or perspective that, you know, the, you know, the, the, that, you know, there's kind of the visible world and the motivations of humans, all that stuff that's very obvious or, you know, whatever to us. But, you know, maybe there are also these other more invisible kind of occult energies sort of functioning underneath and, you know, that are, you know, we don't even really have very good ways to spoke, speak about them. I mean, Steiner talked about, uh, he was an esoteric Christian and he talked about, you um, Kind of spiritual forces that work on the human being all of the time that pull us into these different directions so he you know he took the devil from christianity and he separated out into these different forces that he described as you know this is just mapping it's not like your total you know it's not like an absolute thing but kind of aromatic and luciferic uh, forces like Luc lucifer being a light bringer so these forces that are kind of bringing bringing us up through like imagination genius, inspiration, poetry, but also kind of destabilize us and pull us like away from the earth. I mean, psychedelics are very luciferic. You know, Burning Man is very luciferic in a way. And then, and then another, you know, the Ar Aramonic, which is related to the sort of evil earth spirit of Zoroastrianism, kind of pulling us down towards 
minerality, material technologies, like away from any kind of transcendence or spirituality. And Steiner really felt that, you know, in our time, the aromatic qualities were becoming more, uh, you know, powerful. And that this was like the triumph of, you know, reductive materialism and the scientific method. And that this would ultimately lead to an event in the 21st century, which he talked about as the incarnation of Araman. Uh, which I, I, I tend to think might have something to do with, you know, AI, uh, generalized artificial intelligence, uh, nanotechnology, the convergence of all these different fields of, uh, of inquiry. Um, and yeah, I sort of, I kind of take his ideas quite seriously because, you know, through my own shamanic explorations and, and, you know, experience with ayahuasca, they seem to map the best. Um, um, so yeah, so you know, are we being driven forward? I mean, I know you talked about another friend who used the term of an egregore, um, which is like a sort of collective thought form or Jung talked about archetypes, but Jung also admitted ultimately late in life, those archetypes were very similar to what, you know, shaman, shamanic and, and esoteric cultures talk about as spirits, you know. So are there sort of underlying archetypal forces that seem to be rushing humanity uh, in different directions. I mean, even the idea of the, you know, apocalypse, which I wrote a lot in the 2012 book as, you know, as, as a sort of archetype, uh, you know, for, for Yale, it was ultimately a psychological archetype. It, it represents the, um, the coming of the self into conscious realization, you know, as a student editor talked about. And, but it also means, you know, the unveiling or the revealing of the hidden thing, you know, so are we somehow in sort of this apocalyptic time? Uh, and um, yeah, so, so when I think about you know these conspiracies, I think a lot of them like you know we're never going to be able to figure out who or was was 9/11 orchestrated. I mean, there's so many weird qualities to it. Um, you know, was you know were there aspects of the coronavirus that were orchestrated? Was there a you know weaponized virus? Were there corporate you know pharmaceutical interests who you know wanted to you know turn the world into a sort of weird paranoid prison camp of, you know, and then vaccinate everybody. It feels to me that those, we, when you get into human motivations, it's like, it's like too murky. But if we think that maybe there's, you know, these aromatic energies um, or egregores that are pushing humanity in certain directions, it, it, it gives us a different kind of vector, you know, maybe for thinking about uh, these things. Uh, it opens up spaces for us to, 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 you know, look at the irrational in, in a more, in a more rational way. Yeah, and I don't want to get sort of distracted into the into the detail because I think that's one of the problems when we talk about these alternative narratives or conspiracy narratives is that you get just lost in the weeds very very quickly and then stuck on kind of different pieces of data or information. Although I have looked into like most of the conspiracy narratives, I have looked into to some degree. Like nine eleven, I've I've spent a lot of time arguing with nine eleven conspiracy theorists. I've got quite a bit of. Um, Quite a few thoughts on on that topic maybe to be explored in in a future conversation um but you mentioned the word egregore and there is this is one of the other reasons that I, that I felt it was the right time to have this conversation is that there is a if there's a sort of directionality to where the conversation that i'm tracking is leading it's in that direction we had the kind of the idea of the egregore as some kind of group mind process that came up recently uh through bj campbell and seemed to, we, I interviewed him on Rebel Wisdom, that concept seemed to get a lot of traction on Twitter and elsewhere. And there's also this, there's a quite a few other people homing in on similar ideas. And recently, I know you've seen the conversation that I hosted with Paul Kingsnorth and Mary Harrington, which also seemed to be kind of drifting in that same sort of direction that was looking at a lot of the, the cultural uh, situation, but bringing in a kind of a deeper lens that that felt like it was it was drawing towards the metaphysical. It was drawing towards a sort of a sense of deeper patterns playing out that I think you're you're alluding to as well. That there's that I think whether or not these are analogies or whether or not these are metaphors that that are from people like Steiner or or some of these kind of deeper thinkers of the past, whether or not. But they seem to be pointing to an underlying reality, whether they're actually that, that there, there is a kind of usefulness to a lot of their models that is becoming more useful, because I think we are in those times where we are in the times of the breakdown of the current system. It's a kind of paradigm shift. 
I think is happening as we all sort of see the systems breaking down around us. And I think the, the, the one that's coming through is we've talked a lot in Rebel Wisdom about the kind of return of the irrational or the return of the religious that we're in. We're, we're going back into we're in post secular times. The sort of secular worldview is breaking down and we're, we're now re-entering the times of kind of religion that we never actually left because the technocratic well, the technocratic worldview was actually religion pretending not to be religion, um, which I know you've you've kind of written about in the past as well. You mean like the singularity kind of being like a version of Christian Christian um, kind of salvationism in a way? Yes, yes, and it being and all of that being uh, rested on a kind of faith in human progress, a faith in technological progress, a belief in um, that that in some ways was very was a religious manifestation but yeah that 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 kind of became turbocharged through sort of techno utopianism silicon valley kind of um religious futurism yeah which but, also but works, a, works wonderfully for globalizing corporations that became the sort of ethos because then you know e even though life may be crap you know in the immediate now it's like oh look how great it's all going to be you know in, in 30 years i mean that's how like um you know, Silicon, you know, you know, all this wealth in Silicon Valley, you have like unbelievably horrific homeless population in like Oakland and San Francisco, like, you know, Zuckerberg, take like, you know, a few of those hundreds of millions, you know, build some place for these people to sleep for God's sake. But no, because even though now sucks, there's going to be this like future perfection up ahead where the nano machines clean everything up. And so we don't really have to care about the now, you know, um, mm. you know, that's, that's, yeah, I mean, um, I guess a lot of my, you know, a lot of my work um, has been particularly in the 2012 book to kind of look at uh, these um, kind of parallel uh, philosophical viewpoints, um, whether it's like Gene Gebser and Steiner or and the Mesoamerican cosmologies and um, um, you know kind of uh, see that in ways they're saying the same things, and we get very we're, our problem is that you know we're we're very um, our language is very uh, limited in a way. We get locked in, our language locks us very quickly into a certain paradigm or a certain structure. And then we, we lose our maneuverability, our flexibility to sort of move between these different articulations, you know? So it's like, um, you know, so for me, Steiner is like, it's not like, you know, you want to completely adapt his model of reality, but, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's, one, it's one map. And we, we need a number of different maps that we need to be able to like, shift between the maps and not forget, you know, when we're, when we're in one map and, you know, it's relationship to another map and so on. Um, mm. if that makes any sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And what, what's your, I mean, you watched the conversation between Mary and Paul, what was your sense of the, the kind of direction of travel of that dialogue? Yeah, I didn't absolutely finish it, uh, but I watched a lot of it. Uh, and um, yeah, I, mean, I think that their idea that, um, this technological direction is kind of robbing us of a lot of our humanity. Uh, and, um, you know, the, the life world is being kind of desiccated for this kind of like fanaticism around, around some kind of machine future. Um, you know, I, I resonate with a lot of that. And, you know, when Kingsdorf talks about the sort of the machine, you know, to me, that's similar to the Aramonic idea, you know, or another thinker who ended up with a very similar set of ideas was uh, John Lilly, uh, you know, who, who talked about sort of like a synthetic or like silicon based uh, sentience that was sort of using humans as a vehicle to kind of like get, you know, take over this, this you know, in the, in the material uh, world in a way. Interesting. Um, yeah. I mean, um, some of, you know, some of the, I mean, Mary was talking about sort of uh, reactionary feminism. Was that her term? Yes. Um, so then I was looking to some of that. I was looking to some of the people that women that she talked about and then people that they cited. And, um, you know, you know, it's, it's going to be too much to get into in this conversation. But, you know, I mean, as we know, I went through a whole like cancellation. You know, I admitted to public mistakes around sexuality. And I did do things that I completely think were wrong and, and you know, made all sorts of mistakes. But there was kind of a principle behind it and that I sort of, you know, coming from the sort of 60s, like Allen Ginsberg tradition, he was like a friend of my childhood, and, you know, my mother was a good friend, but I sort of believed principally in this idea of like a, you know, sexual liberation and emancipation of Eros. You know, I was a huge fan of like Herbert Marcuse, like Eros and civilization and so on. And I, and I feel that now that whole line of 
you know, kind of inquiry has been very shut down, you know, by the sort of new kind of like neo-Victorianism and, and I, I don't know, I mean, um, you know, we're at a very strange place um, in, in, ter in terms of all of that. I'm not probably the best person to, to go into all of that, um, but uh, I mean, I really fascinated, like Matt, Matt Taibbi has been covering it. He just did a really great interview with this woman, Laura Kipnis, who's kind of a contrarian, kind of like sex positive feminist who's arguing, she wrote, she wrote a book um, talking about how sort of these Title IX um, kind of things in academic, you know, US, universities in the US where if a professor does anything that's, you know, incorrect, they're then cast out of the university and have to sort of recant that it's very similar to kind of the, um, you know, McCarthyism, like there's a lot of hysteria ar around, around sexuality now. And I don't, I don't know how we bring that down, but it feels like it's part of this, um, yeah, the, the, it's, a, it's a puzzle in the larger puzzle piece that even leads all the way back to the, you know, victory of the right wing in the US and, and Putinism and, you know, the mania that seems to be happening, authoritarianism, I don't know, all these things are all, in my mind, kind of linked together as these different strands and, and to go down one, you ultimately have to connect all of them, you know. Yeah, and you mentioned, um, you used the word cancellation, and I was going to come to that a little bit later, but maybe now's a good time to talk about it, because I, I did ask you before this interview if you'd be happy to, to talk about this, because um, you, you did have a pretty high profile, you called it a cancellation, um, where you, um, I think you've said that you, you misbehaved and were kind of called out publicly for it. Um, and I also thought it was a real opportunity for us to kind of discuss why, because I felt a journalistic obligation to ask about this, um, because, and I, I think it's interesting for us to pull apart, and you, you also recognize that there was a journalistic obligation to ask about this. And I think it's worth maybe pulling that apart because I think we've lost a lot of those, I think a lot of these journalistic techniques became sort of weirdly weaponized in, in the legacy media, but I think we've lost them completely in the alternative media. And I think there is something important here in terms of, like I, I feel like there's an obligation of me bringing this up to make the viewer aware that, of this background and then to be able to make up their minds about whether you're genuinely repentant or whether you are, uh, or, or not. Like, I don't think it would be fair to do this interview without bringing it up, without mentioning it. Um, so maybe, and I'd, I'd like first to kind of ask you a little bit about that event and what happened and what you realized through it or whether you whether you realize whether you recognize that you had misbehaved and um yeah how you reflect on it oh yeah i mean I, I definitely feel that i made all sorts of mistakes um and um yeah i don't really want to go in i mean i, I did an interview with shakuna with a number of like women anthropologists i kind of went through it in, in, in depth i don't necessarily want to like go back over all that ground but yeah, I mean, um, you know, people are not perfect and they make mistakes and um, um, that's part of life, you know, and, and, and we've sort of lost, I mean, you know, I, I went to people that I had wronged or felt that I had wronged and, you know, asked for their forgiveness and, and actually received their forgiveness, at least at that point. I mean, um, yeah, I mean, I don't really know what else one could do. And I thought about, um, um, you know, going through more of like a restorative justice process, but then I spoke to some men who'd gone through that type of process and it really didn't even feel like it, it, it helped or made a difference in a, in a way. I mean, also there was like, you know, we don't even know what constitutes like community at this point, like, um, you know, you know, is there a psychedelic community, you know, who, who, who's running that community, like where, what's the, what's the rules, regulations of the community, I mean, it's, all this stuff is very nebulous, so I felt like I, I did the best that I could do you know, and, and, you know, took a career hit and, and have accepted that and, um, you know, have, you know, tr tried to, you know, change my behavior and be a better person and, and learn from what I did wrong. And I'm still an imperfect person, you know. <laughs> and and what, what you did wrong was, um, would it be fair to summarize as kind of abusing your power and influence for sexual gratification yeah, I mean, I didn't really, you know, the thing is that I honestly didn't really see it at that time in that way. Um, I mean, you know, once again, there were some, you know, there were a couple of very specific times when I, you know, did things that I really regret, you know, involving like drugs and alcohol, which I talked about in that piece. 
but 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 you know, for me mainly, I, I really felt that um, um, the sort of restrictions around eroticism and sexuality were um, you know socially prescribed. But yeah, so sometimes I would have relationships with you know young, younger women or women who were associated with the you know the project that I'd been building, Evolver, uh, and um, you know, I mean, but I was really coming from the sort of Allen Ginsberg perspective where it's like older and younger relationships are like, okay, like teachers and students can have relationships. I mean, he was coming from a, from a gay context, which we, we you know, homosexual, which we tend to think is very different. Um, for me, it was just like kind of normal, but it was also, um, you know, I think that when I was younger, I felt like deprived of certain possibilities. And then suddenly I did become were celebrated and I was part of this um, community that was very explorational. And, uh, you know, I didn't necessarily know what the limits or boundaries were and they weren't even a set back then. And I'd also grown up, you know, in the New York context in the media and literary world in, in my twenties where, you know, alcohol and other drugs fueled a lot of social interactions. So, you know, it was kind of like a different context in a way, um, you know. Yeah. And I also thought it was worth sort of reflecting on what the the journalistic kind of obligation of that is from my perspective. Like I, I know you, we've, we've we've hung out a few times. Um, I I believe that you have genuinely reflected on your behaviour. Otherwise, I don't think I would I would have hosted you here. I think I'd have been more reluctant to do so. But the but but I think the reason for bringing this up, I think, is a is for me, it's a kind of there there is a kind of journalism by numbers thing which I think maybe some of us have internalized of like oh well you have if you speak to this person you have to ask them about this and I think a lot of people get pissed off about that because it's like every time I'm interviewed you bring up this thing that I did and I feel like I've dealt with it and that's not okay and I understand that perspective as well but I think there is a kind of obligation that I feel as someone with with a, with a platform of a certain size it's not the it's not massive it's not kind of anything compared to a lot of legacy media but it has a certain size and hosting you is me saying this person should be listened to. This person's got some, some good ideas. So I do feel that sense of obligation to, to also balance that with, and there are things that, that Daniel has done in the past that, that he's reflected on and, and, and other, others were very unhappy about and he's also reflected on. And I think that's part of the, that for me is part of the kind of responsible, responsibility that we, that I feel that I have and I think hopefully people who, who have some kind of platform also feel to some degree. And I think it's worth, yeah, how do you reflect on that kind of dynamic? Because you're also from a journalistic background. And yeah, no, like I, 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 I think you're right to, to, to ask me. And, you know, I mean, um, and, you know, I, 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 it, it's such a hot button area uh, right now that, it, you know, it's, it's, it's not something that I, you know, like, um, I mean, you know, I, I was sort of in an interestingly, um, kind of, I, I was the one who kind of like spoke out on Facebook and sort of brought it up. You know, maybe I didn't have to do that, but you know, very very few men have you know publicly stepped forward and confessed they did this and that wrong. I mean, Morgan Spurlock is one of the only other men who I know who kind of did that. Kind of in that also like, and he had like a production company which he then lost, and all these projects that 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 got crashed. Um, so it's like, you know. Um, it's, I think, I mean, I, I think that um, it's, a very, it's a very dicey situation, you know, partially because, you know, m men are, have not really been able to tell the, the more complete and complex part of their own story because there's so much anger and, and, and hatred direct, directed, you know, I try, and I tried to do it in the, in the Shakuna piece. I mean, I, I feel that, you know, men like Warren Farrell, I think you maybe have interviewed uh, the, about the myth of male power. I mean, that, that's a very important, Kind of corrective, you know, perspective that um, um, you know we're all, you know we're, we're all we're all flawed, you know. The patriarchy. I mean, he says you know it's the best. You know, it's just men and women have been trying to do their best under situations that have developed over centuries of you know oppression and, and miscommunication and so on. Um, you know, so yeah, and you you know sometimes you know. You know, you, you only grow by making mistakes, and you know sometimes those mistakes hurt other people too, and that's just also part of life. You know. Yeah, and I think there's there's a couple of things here. One is the idea that we're in a kind of pseudo religious panic around lots of different topics, with no, but there is no possibility of redemption. 
like there doesn't seem to be any kind of redemption available for people in right. who've been cancelled or who've been attacked. And the other, uh, interestingly, so Warren Warren actually feels so Warren wrote the myth of male power. Fascinating guy. If people aren't familiar with him, he was quite influential within the women's movement. He was working for the National Organization for Women in the seventies, and then also was started doing hosting men's groups in the same way as the kind of women's consciousness raising groups were happening. And he felt like, oh, there are stories here that haven't been heard because women have never ha had their voices heard in the same way until the 1960s and came into society in a different way. But he said, well, men have never had that. There's never been a space for a men's emotional reality. And this is something that I hear a lot from the guys who come to our men's retreats that they, they're given these weird conflicting messages, which is on one hand to be more emotionally vulnerable, to be more emotionally open, and also to stop taking up so much space. And there's this kind of like paradox in the culture at the moment that I think degenerates into kind of oppositional dynamics between men and women, but hopefully doesn't have to. And I, I feel like maybe we're, we're potentially reaching a place now where we can have a healthier conversation. And interestingly, the other thing I was going to say is that uh, Warren regrets the title, The Myth of Male Power, and now he's republishing it as The Paradox of Male Power, which yeah, I think is a slightly more, slightly less kind of challenging yeah. A, that's, a better, that's a better title. Um, yeah. yeah, and then also, I mean, I mean, you know, this sort of, um, I'm just, I mean, I, it's like, I'm, you know, this is an area where I'm scared to say things that I actually think because it's still it's just so dangerous, you know, in a way. Mm -hmm. But I mean, I mean I'm, I'm watching some of the Johnny Depp, Amber, Amber Heard uh, trial. And, you know, what, what seems to be coming out is that, you know, she was the, you know, abusive one. Uh, primarily, you know, and he was a drunk and a drug addict and chaotic and, you know, maybe not very emotionally expressive or whatever, um, you know, but, the, you know, and th th that's also kind of like, you know, we haven't reached a cultural space where we can be begin to acknowledge kind of female shadow dynamics, um, yeah. you know, which I also, you know, experience, like, you know, people saying untrue things that I had done or, you know, uh, making up you know, and, and, you know, while admitting that I did things that were wrong, that, you know, so um, there's, 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 there's a huge cultural work, uh, societal work that needs to be done here. And, um, you know, it's like, it's, it, you know, the problem is that we just feel like, it feels like we have this ever growing pile, like, you know, okay, we, you know, we haven't dealt, you know, we barely dealt with COVID, we can't deal with the environment. And now we have, you know, this, you know, World War Three. I mean, it's kind of like, you know, plus we haven't dealt with corporate power, plus we have like wealth, you know, inequality, you know, plus we have techno technocratic surveillance society. I mean, it's like how, you know, it, it, it does begin to feel that it's, it, it's just too top heavy, you know, that the whole thing is gonna just, you know, break apart and then we'll have to like pick up the fragments again, you know, whoever's left. You know. Yeah, I'll, I'll just close off the, the gender conversation to get back to some of those, some of those yeah. other topics by, by saying, like in, in a way, the whole gender conversation was really integral to Rebel Wisdom. We started leading men's retreats and did quite a lot of pieces at the beginning with people like Warren Farrell about men and women after Me Too. How, what does a healthy relationship look like? And I think part of it is this sense that we have to get to a point of recognizing that women are people too. There's, there's kind of men often the conversation around toxic masculinity, men will often act out in more violent ways. Women will often act out in more emotionally violent ways. And I think because we're not able to have a sensible conversation about that in the legacy media, in the mainstream, that conversation goes underground and becomes much more toxic. So instead of a conversation, like especially in like the manosphere, instead of a conversation about, yeah, women can act like this, the conversation turns into women will always act like this. Women will always look for someone better than you. Hypergamy, all of this kind of idea, which is obviously a part of the truth for, particularly for, for, for I would say, women and men who have not really evolved internally and are not looking for kind of a partnership with, with someone they consider an equal. Often they're looking for someone they can dominate. And that happens on both sides of the, of the spectrum, like because that conversation is not had in a healthy way, I think it often has gone underground and been ha had in a very unhealthy way. But my sense is, as someone who's kind of dialed into the media landscape, I think we're we're reaching a point where we're able to have that conversation um, 
in a more like I, it feels like we're we're ready for that now. It feels like we're the, the conversation is, and I've had a really interesting conversations with, uh, particularly a BBC um, producer recently, where she brought up out of nowhere the idea of toxic femininity and that the, the conversation felt completely unbalanced, and that would never have happened three years ago. So I'm I'm kind of hopeful that we might be able to move that conversation on in a meaningful way. Um, do you want to say anything or should we go back to conspiracy and Ukraine, whatever, Russia? Whatever, whatever you want to talk about, I'm, I'm at your service. Yeah, <laughs> Let, let's maybe talk about Ukraine, Russia, because that's one of the other reasons that we're having this conversation now is I've seen your, like, because of your your kind of interest in conspiracies and you're, you're, you're in an environment that leans very anti-mainstream, very kind of um, contrarian. And I've seen that space in particular get very, um, like pro-Russian propaganda seems to do very well. Like once people start disbelieving the mainstream narrative, often they'll end up in positions that for me are kind of indistinguishable from like Putin propaganda. And I've seen you take a very morally clear and very ethical line in a way that I think, I've seen so many people get captured by their audience over the period of COVID in particular, and just give their audience what they want and get dragged further and further into a kind of reactive, contrarian position. And what I've seen is that you've actually said many things on this topic where you've, you've, you've challenged your own audience, you've called out people who are friends, like Russell Brand, for some of the stuff that they've been putting out. Um, and that's, yeah, that, that's kind of shown me that, um, yeah, I've been impressed with that kind of moral clarity of just because you realize that the West has lots of problems, it doesn't mean that you're going to overlook the fact that Putin is a, um, yeah, that the Putin, Putin's like Russia a is a kind of old imperial, <laughs> old imperialist power and doing things that no Western country would be able to get away with nowadays without kind of mass public um, uproar and et cetera, et cetera. So, yeah, what, what's your take on, on broader take on kind of uh, Russia and Putin at the moment? Uh, yeah, well, I mean, um, I think there's no doubt that it's an extremely dangerous uh, situation, um, you know, for the world. I mean, I mean, um, but I also, you know, don't don't think. I mean, I, I think that we're, you know, the West is doing the right thing by kind of rallying and, and, and supporting them, you know, with weaponry. Um, I mean, there's so many different takes to be had. Maybe, maybe you can focus me on which part of the take. I mean, um, uh, yeah, yeah. Why do Why do you think many? Are failing to sort of see the wood for the trees when it comes to well, a lot Putin of America. a lot of American or European American leftists have uh, extreme animosity towards kind of you know the U.S. And, and its allies over the last decades for you know tons of atrocious activities, um, you know the Gulf War, the Iraq War, uh, you know overturning democratically elected governments in South America, um, you know supporting Saudi Arabia, which is another, you know, miserable dictatorship, you know, obviously for, you know, energy interests and so on. So, the, you know, the, the sense is that the, the, you know, the West is completely, and the U.S. in particular, completely forfeited any kind of claim to moral authority or even legitimacy, and therefore has no right to, you know, stand up in, in this situation. And that's a tough argument. I mean, it, you know, it's, it's you know, it's, it's I mean, you know, what are you going to say, really? I mean, the Iraq war, like maybe a million Iraq citizens died, you know, was trumped up um, evidence on weapons of mass destruction. It seems kind of clear that um, on the one hand, you had like the project for a new American century with like Cheney and so on. And they, you know, wanted a provocation to go into the Middle East uh, and talked about how they needed like a Pearl Harbor level uh, inciting incident to be able to ac access the strategic oil reserves of the Middle East. And then the whole thing was handled so incredibly badly we had such hubris and arrogance and you know probably maybe a little bit like you know Putin over the last couple of years we built up this huge military arsenal and like they were you know the military brass were like we want to use our toys and test out what we can do and you know how good are we at our you know with our new destructive mechanisms and so on so you know that was an atrocity but you know what are we going to do I mean you know I think that uh, Putin has made very clear if you read a lot of his speeches that he doesn't really you know intend to stop at Ukraine, and he doesn't even really necessarily see this as a, as a war with Ukraine. He sees it as a war with the U.S. And with, and with NATO. And so either, you know, he is kind of ground to a halt and, and you know, kind of um, some type of like line of resistance is actually 
established or it's very likely that he just continues, you know, and, and also, I mean, this poor you know, country of Ukraine, which to be honest, I didn't know too much about um, before. I mean, I hadn't been like studying Ukraine or whatever. I mean, I, you know, now it's like, it's all lurking in the background. Like if we go back to like 2016 election and Hunter Biden in Ukraine and Trump and Russia in Ukraine, it's like, this really seems like it was simmering uh, in the background of everything that happened in the US, but, um, you know, it, it does seem that this is a cult country that had a lot of, you know, problems and, you know, different factions and has been trying to modernize and, and you know, kind of identify the president that they rallied behind and believed in as like a step towards like Europeanization and modernization. You know, what, you know, sane group of people, you know, would, would given the opportunity, want to choose Putinism? You know, who would want to be under a military dictator you know, who creates a kleptocratic oligarchy and, and robs everybody's, everybody blind to feed his own narcissistic power. You know, so, you know, what are we gonna do? We're sort of trapped now, you know, to, and, you know, and, and then, you know, then the arguments are that the, um, you know, it was actually the US's fault, like Mearsheimer is one of the ac academics who's saying, okay, like, um, you know, we have made a line in the sand, we promised, you know, Russia that, you know, Ukraine would never become part of NATO. Um, um, but yeah, I don't think that that um, you know that argument um, works uh, very well. I have, I have different reasons. Hold on, it'll come back to me for a second. Uh, well, what do you what do you think about that? Actually, I'll turn it over to you. The Mearsheimer argument. Yeah, I mean that's another one of the leftists have, have you know the the, the European yeah. American leftists have grabbed onto the sense that actually it's the U.S.'s fault you know, as almost everything in the world is because yeah. we knew that if we flirted with NATO membership for Ukraine, um, you know, it was going to lead to this. You know. Yeah, I, I think he makes the best version of that argument for sure. And it's it's fascinating that the left is, this is sort of the horseshoe theory that's interesting to watch because Mearsheimer is a kind of, probably best described as a paleoconservative, like a definitely a kind of foreign po policy realist. He's no, he's certainly not on the left, but he's being embraced by a lot of what, what is now the kind of anti-war, anti-imperialist left. And he makes a good argument. I think you can definitely say that the 2008 promising of NATO membership to Ukraine was a complete error that was made in a sort of at a time when the West sort of saw Russia as being kind of very weak, uh, very weak. And also, it's fascinating to think about like what it must be like for someone like Putin who grew up for in a formative year when Russia was an equal par partner or seen as an equal par partner with. The US as a genuine superpower and that sense of humiliation, that sense of thwarted ambition that really drives him and drives a lot of the Russian psyche. I think it's an incredibly narrow and pretty solipsistic perspective to say that the US is primarily responsible and that the US has missteps around Russia. And but you're taking out the fact like it's a pretty harsh perspective to say the US should not or NATO should not have promised membership to. Um, the Baltic states, for example, because they were desperate to have that protection because they were terrified about Russia. They saw what Russia was up to in, in its borders. It saw what it did in the Caucasus. It saw what it did in Georgia, and they desperately wanted protection. So it's a pretty, like, I think Mearsheimer is articulating a very hardcore realist perspective of Russia is an angry wolf or an angry bear and will act out in, in these ways. So we have to accommodate Russia's desire for control of its near of its environment it's like well okay that's a consistent perspective but you're you're consigning an awful lot of Ukrainians you're consigning an awful lot of Latvians Estonians and Polish almost certainly to to domination by a, an empire they don't want to be ruled by and if you've I, I, I've got a bit more connection to Ukraine there was a, an event that we went to in Kiev in 2019, I think, and met quite a few of the people there who were sort of fighting for democracy, who were looking towards the West. And I couldn't really look them in the eyes and say, no, actually, this isn't this isn't for you. Like it's not up. And I, so I think what we're doing at the moment is the right, but like Ukraine is taking the 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 main, they're, they're lifting their own weight. Like some of my friends there say that this is their blood sacrifice for creating themselves as a nation. Like this is. This is the environment where Ukraine, like what they're going through now could sustain them for hundreds of years as a kind of national mythology. 
And that's extraordinary to see in real time, something like Zelensky or who's somehow stepped up into this role that you would never have imagined someone with his background having stepped up into. And, and they're the ones who are obviously lifting the biggest weight, but we're supporting as much as we can get away with without provoking Russia into, into sort of provoking nuclear war or provoking like a, a, a conflict that might spiral out of control. And so far, I think we're doing, we're doing that pretty well. Um, so that would be my kind of summary as someone, like I'm a former foreign producer, so I kind of follow a lot of these things to, to, to a fairly keen degree. That would be my, my biggest take is I think we're doing the right thing. I think we could potentially even step it up with more weaponry. Um, and obviously there's a geopolitical aim as well that we wanted to weaken Russia. But to be honest, they've weakened themselves. The, the, the ludicrous um, nature of how detached from reality Putin had become and how weak the Russian army had become and how, like in a way that's, that's really reassuring. It's like those, it's reassuring to realize that those levers of power that Putin feels that are at his disposal and those all of, all of those kind of um, army units on the map maybe don't really exist in any meaningful way. It feels a little bit like um, kind of Hitler in the bunker where at the end of that, the downfall movie where the kind of the, the like the sixth army that he's moving around, it's like that doesn't exist anymore. So th there's a sense that now, do you think, of, you, think of, do you think if Hitler was in the bunker and had 6,000 nuclear weapons and, and knew he was about to go down, he would have hit the button? That's the pretty ter that's the terrifying thing is whether there is enough yeah if you start thinking about Putin's psychology and you recognize like what kind of like what kind of man he is like what kind of man he was in Dresden before like he's been steeped in murder and and chaos since since he was Poison. in his 20s yeah, yeah like he, I, re I read the uh, the Fiona Hill book the operative in the Kremlin I mean I, I in no yeah. way consider myself an, an, like an expert you know on, on this yeah I mean, I've been catching up and reading you know, stuff from different perspectives. But um, yeah, I mean, I think, I hope that it wasn't, you know, this, this idea of like totally isolating Russia. I mean, I know they're kind of doing it to themselves, but I mean, if you watch like the state TV, uh, you know, broadcast from Russia, I mean, they're literally terrifying. I mean, they're like, they're really like, you know, almost like wanting to push it to thermonuclear confrontation in a way that I've never even seen. Or it's, um, you know, it, it does also bring up, you know, some of these prophetic ideas around, you know, you know, I was talking to friends last night, you know, who were saying that who sort of reminded me that 2024 is like apparently a big, you know, number in the Kali Yuga kind of ideas for some, for some, mm. I mean, you know, is this just like a, you know, inevitable, you know, removing some kind of inevitable threshold of, you know, catastrophe, you know, you know, and yeah. you massive heat waves in like Africa and India, like, you know, at a certain point, Human beings can it goes up to like 100. I don't know what it is, 120 degrees. And human, humans only survive for a few hours. And then, I mean, one, one of the horrible things that's so annoying is like, you know, Russia will be the great beneficiary of climate change. Like, um, mm. you know, they're they're turning out to be this most regressive force on the planet, but they're also going to be the beneficiaries if everything else heats up and Africa and India become totally unlivable and everything descends into chaos. You know, in you know the Siberia, they'll be like, you know growing you know daffodils you know so mm. um, yeah you you mentioned that one other thing that comes up as well is the idea of the nuclear taboo which you're kind of a lot kind of alluding to there i think for, for us kind of rational people we kind of assume that everyone else is rational i don't think you can but then i don't think the nuclear taboo necessarily holds with putin like you can, I can definitely see him using a tactical nuke in, in Ukraine just to demonstrate his power. The fact that he's prepared yeah, to do things. Absolutely. He's prepared to do things that the West is not prepared to do or would not. Um, so I think I think we have to be very careful not to let that escalate. But I can see that as being a kind of end game of the war of, of him like demonstrating I'm prepared to do things that you wouldn't that you that. I'm, I'm a crazy I'm crazy and I'll do I'll I'll take things to a limit that you will not take things to before he pulls back from Ukraine. That seems very, very plausible. We don't, we don't know if he's using the Richard Nixon madman approach where, you know, Vietnam, yeah, we might just come and nuke you, you know, or if he's actually gone kind of over, over the border, you know? 
Yeah. Uh, but, but you know, the only thing that would prevent him, you know, because clearly he doesn't care about human life and he doesn't care about destroying cities or populations or mm. absolutely barbaric, you know, activity, uh, would be this idea that you know using those nukes would end his alliance with like China and like you know it's yeah you know, it, it is this realization that these all these you know countries around the world you know are not even sanctioning Putin whether it's like Mexico or Brazil mm. you know so the, the sort of like. You know, it, it does feel that, um, you know, we have on the one hand our kind of flawed, you know, somewhat, you know, in distress democracies that, that have like just holding on by their, their, their fingernails. And now this sort of, you know, growing, you know, autocratic totalitarian states and that unfortunately a lot of the technology that we thought was going to be a tool for liberal, you know, liberalization, you know, liberation. Is actually turning out to be, you know, even more effective for autoc autocracies like China, you know, with the social credit system. So, yeah, I mean, you know, I don't know if you have to hope for another set of technological breakthroughs, whether it's like mesh networks where people can have like messaging that doesn't require like a centralized mm -hmm. internet or, or whatever. But um, yeah, it's it's some freaky stuff. But um, um, yeah, I was I was actually there, Daniel, in the Arab Spring because that was the high point of this kind of idea of like networked new technologies creating. So 2011, yeah. I was in Turia Square in, in Egypt, then um, Bahrain, where the, the amazing kind of Pearl Roundabout. So I, I was there for this incredible euphoric. I was there when, when Mubarak resigned in, in Egypt, and it was like Egypt had just won the World Cup. Like the, the whole place just erupted and that was all that was largely fueled by social media it was it was the high point of the hopes that that was what this these technologies would do you had um whale gonim was the egyptian google executive who was kind of at the, at the center of the of the protests there and that was the sort of sense and then grow, there was a growing realization over the next few years of oh no these technologies can be weaponized as well they can be used for for good but they can also be used for social control. So sort of a, a growing realization about that. I, th I think also um, for me, like, you know, why didn't Gonim then stay in Egypt and build sort of like a participatory democracy, social network infrastructure? You know, why mm. didn't they then experiment with, you know, because that's also where these tech companies are, um, you know, still trapped in this like profit uh, model. Whereas actually, you know, that would have been the time to innovate with like, you know, local, I mean, that's what I kind of, the kind of the stuff I write about in How Soon Is Now is, you mm -hmm. know, if we were to conceive of another model, it would be sort of like local participatory democracies from like the very local to the bioregional uh, to the planetary, you know, with, with the nation states slowly becoming more like vestigial the same way like ar aristocracies have since like the 17th or 18th century. Uh, but yeah, so it was like a huge opportunity lost. And another huge opportunity lost, I mean, where I, I disagree with Mearsheimer, because I feel that if NATO is essentially a defensive alliance, you know, which it seems like it is, you know, NATO actually exists because to stop Putin from doing exactly what Russia is now doing. So if, if Ukraine had been part of NATO, you know, then we probably wouldn't be in this situation, you know, if, it, if, it, if we'd done it at an earlier stage. But I mean, um, where I think, the, from my perspective, where the, 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 you know, the US failed and the, sort of the West failed was earlier on, like if you read Naomi Klein's The Shock Doctrine, uh, she talks about how, you know, as the USSR was breaking up, we had our, you know, Chicago School economists of the Milton Friedman School went into Russia, they were like, okay, now you got to go into like turbocharged hypercapital, hypercapitalism, you know, all of your enterprises are state owned, so we smash them up, we sell them off to the highest bidder, you know, that led to oligarchy and it led to this sort of kleptocratic system and it led to Putinism, you know, whereas if we had had a longer game plan, you know, or a willingness to experiment, you know, with other social systems, we'd be okay, like for a while, let's try like hybrid socialism, capitalism, let's see what happens with these systems, if they can be beneficial, because there were, you know, benefits, like if you talk to people who grew up in the, in the, in the Soviet countries, like there was a, a sense of commonality, you know, there, there was a sense of, you know, not such stratification between the wealthy and everybody else. There was a sense of like shared, you know, collective interest, you know, so, so yeah. we annihilated all of that stuff. And we said, all, all you get now is free market capitalism, which is exactly what we did in the Arab Spring. So it's like, that's why we need like a new, you know, social political ethos, a new idea for what we, what, you know, what we do with societies like post-catastrophe or post-rebellion.
you know yeah you you're right to point to like it was the 90s when we kind of imposed this very sort of naive free market capitalism but you could argue the same thing happened in iraq and in afghanistan so in a way like the problem the problem of how you create the conditions for successful societies is a deeper one than than that that we haven't been able to figure out even to this day because what happened in russia was by imposing free market capitalism without functioning rule of law without functioning press without any of the civil society checks and balances that lead to functioning democracies uh, in in the west all you did was create the conditions for oligarchy and takeover and in the end you had putin because he had the deepest like the fsb or the kgb because they 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 had all the power before they eventually just took over and putin is sort of the the chief gangster recipient of that kind of very naive perspective that that yeah i i, I completely agree that's that's where we that's where we screwed Russia, um, but it's the same. But it's the same thing that then played out, particularly in, like Afghanistan is the most fascinating example because we were there for twenty years and still managed to create almost no lasting institutions. Like it, it's astonishing. Like we don't know. We have no idea how to well, do you, this. But you can't impose those from above, right? They have to come yeah. from local local culture. So you, you would have to. You know, have a have a much deeper sensitivity to local culture and 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 you know what what types of you know positive mm. new institutions can arise from what is already there. I think you know. But I imagine yeah. they were trying that in in Afghanistan, and still that made no difference. Like they were looking for people who wanted to kind of create girls' schools and all of the things that we thought were beneficial. But I think it had it, and I think they thought they created some kind of civil society, but they realized when the Taliban came back, it had no deep roots. Right. Because I think, and that's partly to do with the developmental map. If you look at like Wilbur's idea of developmental maps, they're trying to graft on a, a green or an orange system onto something that's probably deeply red and still very tribal. So may, maybe there are countries where that would work and you can actually just support because for me, there's, a, there's an obligation. If you look at somewhere like Russia, for me, there's an obligation of us morally supporting the protests in Russia, for example. Like those people who are prepared to be arrested and jailed for opposing Putin, like for me, there's a, there's a strong moral obligation of supporting those people in whatever way that we can, that, that obviously Putin would then see as a, as a kind of Western plot or a, as a kind of Western imposition or interference in Russian internal affairs which in some ways it is from his perspective, like there's no way of avoiding that. But at the same time, it feels to me to be a, a, a complete no brainer that we should validate support that kind of bravery among people trying to create a better society in, in Russia, but it's, but it's tricky. What would that support look like and what could we actually do for them? I mean, I mean we had, I mean, I've noticed that like a million, apparently something like a million Ukrainians have been taken out of Ukraine and resettled in distant areas of Russia and, and Hundred over 120,000 children apparently have been, you know, essentially kidnapped, and they're being, you know, you know, given to Russian families to raise. I mean, you know, and that's actually, you know, among the many aspects of why this war is happening, one one of them might actually be the sort of demographic crisis that Russia is facing. So they have like an aging, you know, sad aging population. Nobody wants to reproduce anymore because it's so miserable there. They're actually just going and like stealing like young people from another country to kind of keep their their thing going. Um, yeah, yeah. We don't seem to do you know we don't have any way to 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 deal with that really. Like what what can what can we do? We're helpless you know, at this point. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I guess one of the other things is is this is an information war as much as it's anything else. And I wonder whether part of the kind of morale of the troops that like everyone's been really clear, like the morale of the Russian troops has been terrible, might be because they're getting stuff on their smartphones, showing them that like, you can't really control the media as much as you need to. And so maybe some of that stuff is leaking through about what they're actually doing there. Um, so I, I'm kind of reminded of things like, even like Reuters or the British Council or any of these kind of outlets in places like Russia that are kind of bringing forth kind of Western values about kind of multiplicity of perspectives or a kind of functioning media independent from the government, even those things are seen as, um, are seen as kind of deliberate Western propaganda undermining Russian values by the Russian state. But those are the things that I think we have to, 
I, I think we have to be much more um, confident in, in, in our values to some degree while recognizing that yeah. a lot of the, well, I mean, the structures. Yeah. yeah, I mean, that's a big issue. We've lost, we've totally lost confidence in, in our values and, you know, for good reason. I mean, our values have not been well expressed, you know, with things like the Iraq war and kind of, um, um, yeah, I mean, uh, it's, a, it's a very it's a dicey situation. <laughs> yes, but, but but I would say like the flip side of that, I completely agree. Like the Iraq War was was a was worse than a crime. It was a blunder, and I think yeah. it was polluted, has destroyed know, I, 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 anything. I think crimes are still worse than blunders. <laughs> yeah, well, that's a realist. That's a that's a kind of famous realist quote. That, okay. That that the world will will forgive crimes, but they will not forgive blunders. Yeah. Um. That's sort of yeah. It's 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 a bit it's a bit pokey. But like my my perspective as well. That um, are you familiar with Paul Berman's work? Uh, yeah, sounds really familiar. New York intellectual. He yeah. wrote Terror and Liberalism, and also right. Power and the right. Idealists, right. which is a story that I think needs to be better known because he talks about how that a lot of these a lot of these kind of statesmen who came of age during the nineteen sixties riots, like Bernard Kouchner and Joska Fischer in Germany. Oscar Fischer was a, was a green politician who then became defense minister. And when he became defense minister, they found pictures of him kind of rioting in 1968. And he, there was a big scandal in Germany about, oh, this, this kind of reprobate now is a politician. And Paul Berman tells the story of these kind of hugely anti-establishment types who had to then make peace with what it meant to actually have the responsibilities of power and how he felt there was this sort of nascent um sense of obligation and humanitarian intervention that was growing slowly through the 1990s through Kosovo and through Yugoslavia which originally was like oh we're not going to get involved in that and then there was sort of some sense of like obligation and there were some humanitarian interventions Sierra Leone in particular in 2001 and how this kind of nascent I would say positive development was then obliterated by Iraq, was taken mm. advantage of by Bush and these sort of very cynical American. And Tony Blair for me is a kind of figure who was trying to hold it together, but in the end, I think made the deal with the devil of, of going with the Americans. And like that is a really fascinating history because I think in after Iraq, the whole idea of anything like humanitarian intervention is toxic and maybe needs to be toxic because you can't impose solutions from the outside. But I think that whole Iraq debate has completely toxified and destroyed, particularly on the left, any sense of being able to argue, because that whole Iraq thing is now framing our response to Syria, it's framing our response to, to, to many conflicts that have nothing to do with Iraq. And I think has been a kind of completely warping factor on the, on the kind of landscape ever since. Understandably, but I think, it's, I think seeing everything through the lens of Iraq is, is one of the central problems even now of, of the of the conversation around Ukraine, Russia, like seeing, oh, only seeing like what the states, what the United States is up to and seeing them as the prime actor and them being the main, you know, main problem is, is yeah. deeply troubling. I mean, another thing is like, if you read uh, Fiona Hill's book, I mean, it's clear that Putin is kind of brilliant. I mean, I mean he did take a very you know, rough hand of cards and, and built it up into, you know, you know, a massive thing. I mean, he rebuilt, the power of Russia to a great degree. And although, you know, now the Western media is saying that he's losing and, you know, it's a disaster and we're all coming together, you know, it's not at all clear that he's even going to lose this at all. I mean, and because, um, you know, he's been studying the West for decades and, you know, he saw, you know, what he, what he noticed is like, you know, as and I think you mentioned this earlier, autocratic regimes, like as long as he's in power, you know, he's, he's, it's very simple. He just says, we do this and we do that. You know, with with us, like you know, if somebody else gets elected, if Trump gets elected in twenty four, all of our initiative to try to like help Ukraine, you know, could just collapse, or we could have, you know, or, mm. you know, I mean, the the right wing is is a catastrophe in the U.S. and you know, um, so you know, he may not be thinking that it's going as badly as we we think it is for him. Uh, mm. You know, even with the soldiers getting chewed up and the military, because he's just going to build. I mean, he has you know, oil, he has resources, he has metal, you know, he can just keep building stuff and like throwing it into, into the mix um, until, until he grinds us down. 
Um, so that's another thing. We don't even know which perspective is, is accurate at this point. I mean, uh, hopefully, yeah. you know, here, I mean, it's like tragic because like I've always, I think I've hated the US military budget and our, you know, you know, but you know, suddenly I'm reading about 155 howitzers with 152 howitzers, and I'm really hoping ours are like you know significantly better than the old Soviet 152 ones or whatever. But you know, we, we have been putting 800 billion a year, uh, you know, into the military budget. You know, hopefully we have, you know, some some useful stuff. You know? <laughs> so you're a you're a kind of late um, late blooming hawk. I'm not a hawk at all. I mean, I'm a pacifist, but I mean, you know. That, that's the thing is it's like we're looking at this pylon of, of catastrophe on top of catastrophe. I mean, you know, how can we possibly, you know, I mean, the climate movement is growing. There's been more, you know, expressions of, you know, for climate justice or reparations, whatever, in you know, the US, the UK, you know, a thousand climate scientists around the world, but, you know, just got arrested or whatever, protested. But, you know, we can't do anything as long as Russia is this fully regressive thing. I mean, the oil and the coal is going to keep flowing. I mean, China is still building probably coal plants, as far as I know. I mean, um, so it's all it's all interlinked in, in some way, right? Like, how how do we make any real progress until somehow this changes, if it if it can change, you know? Yeah, this is another topic we could we could jump off on. Um, but um, the one thing I will say, yeah, my my framing with the climate conversation has always been. This intense focus on on the West has always seemed quite naive, given China is creating a new coal fired power station every every week. Like the geopolitics of it, I think is is very difficult to see how because they're also not responsive to public opinion. Like the problem, like it doesn't matter how much kind of how many pretty pictures of Greta Thunberg or kind of lambasting kind of the Western leaders we have actually they are in many ways more responsive and more uh, amenable to public opinion. And where, whereas, whereas China and Russia just aren't. And I don't see how you get any collective action without them being involved. And it's kind of naive, like in a way, like I understand people who are saying, well, go on Greta, why don't, why don't you go to, to Beijing and just see what response you get there? Like that I, I think makes a lot of sense. Yeah, I mean, well, I guess the argument until recently has been that our, our legacy use of CO2 is still, you know, gigantic, you know, proportionally compared to these other countries, which have just gotten into the game more recently. And, you know, there's also the, you know, the reality that China, I think, you know, is, you know, has, you know, has already created more renewable energy, you know, by far, it has that potential. I mean, uh, what I what I argued in, you know, how soon is now, um, trying to figure out a solution uh, kind of model, you know, if, if the West, you know, because in a way like China has taken a lot of, you know, Western capitalism and kind of, you know, instituted it in their own form. If we were to develop a new sort of, um, you know, echo anarchist, you know, local model that, you know, was, was, was better for people, you know, maybe that would become something that other cultures of the world would start to, to imitate. You know, and for me, then that comes back to, you know, consciousness, monistic idealism, psychedelic experience, like, you know, maybe there's a whole different line of flight towards like a, a local utopian model that, does, that, is, that isn't so dependent on, you know, um, all this, all this uh, energy output and, 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 and um, you know, industrial use. We've got plenty more topics that we haven't even touched yet, Daniel, but... I think this is a, a good place to, yeah. to close this one. So thank you. Yeah, thank you. As I said, it's overdue. I've really enjoyed this conversation and look forward to more in the future. Me too, buddy. Have a great, have a great day. Thanks for watching all the way to the end. So we release videos on YouTube around once a week, and you can also find all these interviews and conversations on the Rebel Wisdom podcast feed. And we're also doing deep dive written newsletters on Substack. Check out the link in the show notes and please sign up there and you'll get everything sent direct to your inbox, including special previews, extra content for subscribers, and also you can join the conversation that we're hosting on Substack. We've also recently launched a big project called the Sense Making Companion. It's split into three parts with videos, workbooks, and much more, and it's completely free. Again, check out the link in the show notes and hope to see you soon.